reconsidered and we've reconsidered it twice already. So this is going to be the third time we're going to reconsider it this morning. Uh, so I'm very pleased to welcome Simon Alford and Paul Monahan who have uh, been practicing together in the UK for 20 years, they tell me. And uh, they are part of Alford, Paul, Monahan and uh, Morris. So um, please welcome to the stage. It's been interesting to in the last 20 years in the city we're in. Um, what we've talked today about is two of six towers we're working on. They're not ground scrapers and they're not skyscrapers. They're the sort of generic tower that exists in England, which is this tower that goes from 20 to 30 to 40 stories. It's a pocket tower, or a pencil tower as we call it. It's never more than 10,000 square feet of floor plate. It changes from residential to office. And it's really the new background building in, in, you know, in London, Liverpool, Leeds, the cities around the UK that are beginning to develop attitudes to tall buildings. Really, post-war, the only tall buildings we had in the UK were either central city office blocks or pretty low-grade residential social housing. And in that sense, these, these small towers became uh, sort of not dignified, but stultified in a sense. So these are really, these projects are beginning to question how we might think about that. There's an idea about slenderness ratio. Um, if you look at the, you know, the Burj, it's remarkable, not just because it's height, but because it's, it's you know, pencil-like proportion. And in a sense, London has got a grid, so they're harking back to historical models where it's not so much how tall a building is, but the proportion, is it eight to one, etc. The English context is particular, um, there's, there's a fear of height. London's a global city, a global force, but if you get above eight to ten stories in the centre of London, you're already looking out over a, a medieval city plan. Um, this goes back to the 60s when the Smithsons dropped The Economist in the middle of Mayfair, in the middle of St James's, and it was deemed to be a, a radical new model. So radical indeed that they suggested it, it might grow as a series of stucks around that, that central part of the town. And there you see the two ideas of you know, the, the small town in London. Towers are coming in pairs, often because they're office and residential. So the concept of the mixed-use stack tower is not yet commercially viable in the UK. It's very much one and the other. We're still a party in the city. So here you see St James on the left, you have the low-rise element of the economist. On the right, a high-rise. It's only 18 floors, but it stands out in the tower. So it's an evolving context we're working in. A context in a sense where there isn't less and less policy and more and more speculation. So this is our, our personal journey and these buildings, interesting enough, tend to move in from the city fringes. They start off at 12 to 15 storeys and when you get into the city fringes you might get to 40 or 50 storeys. The last being a tall building we're looking at above the tube station in central London. Um, so, London has a strange context. We have to explore it in a section. And we have this extraordinary set of relationships where, to the right, you have the outline of Renzo Piano's shard, um, and, you know, the Tate, Tate model in the distance. And then a small tower is suggesting 18 storeys, a residential tower, like Kevin's saying, you know, moving away from the glass building, this is a concrete extrusion, wrapped in aluminium, um, high-density urban living. Um, this is the, the basic diagram of the building. Then the concept comes along that you can't go above the 8 to 12 storeys in central London, and you have to remove the upper floors. Um, you do that for the first planning consent, you then go back a year later with another 12. Um, one has to contextualise towers. So this is us working in Docklands, which is that middle band between Canary Wharf and the city, where the tower has to be kind of linked into other e elements around it. It is a local landmark. Um, in this case, it's a, a 36 and a 40 storey residential tower. They're twinned, they're engaged. There again, there's only 10 flats of floor, it's about 10,000 square feet. But these two towers sit pretty much in isolation over Victorian infrastructure. So it's really a question of cutting the eye of the needle through the infrastructure of London. And then looking and justifying it as a local landmark. So you get this idea that these buildings are very specific to their context. They offer something back to the city. As you move into the city, 
that public immunity tends to rise up to the top of the building, becomes the, you know, the skyline that's open to the public. Although Westminster recently advised me they've got more skyline than they need, and um, could we stick you know, to keeping, keeping the buildings down the floor level. But on these outer levels, it's about cutting away and saying, actually, we can solve an infrastructural problem. We can create a new park, a new, a new urban space, we can make new connections, we can build new bridges, um, metaphorically and physically, to tie together the lost lands. And this is the idea of the skin, the series of vertical things that actually move around the building, adjusting to pick up wind and shelter balconies behind. And of course, all of this makes you realise that these buildings you know, have a life cycle. It was mentioned this morning, you know, what is that life cycle of these buildings? This is us looking at recycling two 1960s towers. Interestingly, um, structural uh, calculations such that we, we worked out we could add 12 floors to each of these towers to build them through. Unfortunately, London has a, you know, a physical map, a glass ceiling, that prevents the rise of these buildings. But here it's just about wrapping a new, sophisticated, glazed veneers and insulated skin with a glazed finish around these towers. So this is this is the kind of this is the London view from Parliament Hill. To the left you see the city as it's emerging with the towers contrasting with the slabs. But to the two-thirds of the slide to the right you see what the bulk of the city is. It's actually low rise and these little landmarks are, are the, the sort of points that break out of the skyline. There's quite an extraordinary thing that St Paul's is to be preserved in aspect as the greatest view um, historically of London. Yet, at any moment in time, it's surrounded by cranes, which are actually a permanent feature of London's skyline, which are never seen by anyone conceptually, but in fact always exist. So St Paul's is an icon that is um, creating this dish around London. So, just to conclude this part of the talk, I'll just talk about one particular project. It's two towers, a tall one and a stout. One is an office building, one is a residential building, 80 floors high. This is the imaginary view taken from a balloon before balloons existed, overlooking London. This is the, you know, the London of Wren, the London of Spires. And then this is us actually analysing that kind of strange South London site, a site cut up by railway lines, cut off from the city, always a place of um, rather more interesting activities that occur in the city. Now this is the idea of the buildings that emerge as a simple crystalline form, responding to its very, very tight site. The form cuts away and adjusts to do with all the rules and regulations and psychological powers that affect the building. So it becomes a series of movements to cut it away. It pulls a core to one side so it becomes asymmetrical to create large coral-free space. And then it cuts away its four faces, one to the north to give views to the river, to the rooftop to give a profile, to the ground to give generous public realm, and to the south to deal with an issue of solar load and overlooking. So there's this new object sitting within the city. And then this is the great debate. We've been through numerous debates about context and design and contextualization of the tower. But in the end, it becomes a discussion of lift and delivery. This seems to be one of the few logics that we can use in our discussions the height of the building. Working with Adams Cara Taylor here, a simple concrete, stiff wall structure wrapped in a light steel frame. Now this is its corollary, this is the other tower that joins at the hip, a little residential block that bolts into this building. And the skin itself is, a, again, like the previous Reclad Tower, which was a research project for this, is a glass wrap. The, the glass is the veneer, behind it is a solid um, wall with perforated apertures. And the skin itself, unfolded, is responding very much to the pure orientations it generates, the four generates. And of course this is the great London view, we have our local views at the bottom, then we have our key view from St James's Park, which is always uh, fully in bloom because the leads are good at hiding buildings. And this is the idea of the building within the city itself. And then how this building sits, so it maintains the uh, classic uh, quality that Ken is so concerned about, but this is now a glass as a wrap to a solid box within. And then the view of the building is a pinstripe building. It makes a comment about the city. It's bringing the city south, south over the river to South London. Um, this is the final project in London, which is um, a project between embarking and regenerating embarking in town centre. Just on the map there on the left is uh, the city. So the last project you've just seen was just to the, the furthest left of that page. You can then 
this is Canary Wharf. As you go up from Canary Wharf, you can see Stratford City, which is the Olympic Village, being developed for the Olympic Games in 2012. And then the first station to the right of that, in what's called the Thames Gateway, is Barking Town Centre. And, um, this project has been going on for about seven years now, and it's, uh, it's, its first phase has just been completed. Barking um, in the 30s was a very prosperous town. Um, these are pictures from, around 19, from, from the 30s. Um, mostly its employment was based on, on the docks, the huge docks that have uh, now long since been redundant. And then later on, um, a huge forward uh, plant in Dagenham. Um, our project is surrounded by that photograph in the middle on the bottom, which is the town hall. Um, it's, it's, it involves a new library and it involves the housing around that entire centre of the town. Um, on our site, um, originally, um, was R. White's Lemonade, it's like 7-Up, um, um, and that was their main factory, their main headquarters, uh, which gave us some clues to the colour of the building when we finally designed it. And what you see here is the town hall on the right, um, a library in that, in, underneath that V-shaped arcade, and then housing above the library, um, and the housing, if you like, pays for the library and the public realm. And that's the sort of commercial, public-private deal that's going on, and goes on so much in so many places in London. Here is the, the elevation uh, completed as phase one, and there you can see the giant arcade with these special light fittings that have been designed specially by Tom Dixon. And then we have the, the Town Hall Square, um, the Town Hall on the right, um, and the entrance to the library on the left. Um, the, the square is part of um, two bits of public realm that form the project. Um, the second is what's called the Arboretum, a forest in the middle of the town. And um, what we're doing now is starting to build the other five buildings, um, which will form the, the first part of the, the regeneration of parking. Um, three of the buildings, the ones in yellow, private apartments, there's a very small bit of affordable housing. But the purple building is a bike shed. It's got bicycles, 350 bicycles in it, and a bike, bicycle shop at the bottom. The blue is a hotel. And this um, forms, one of the buildings, the one at the very end, called the Lemonade Building, is, is, um, is tall relatively. It's 18 stories high, which in a two-story town makes it a tower, and makes it a landmark for the um, It's the values in Barking are very low. Um, we had to build the flats to, to very economic standards. And therefore we have very little to play with elevation. It's a solid tower, as Ken, Ken talked about, some more solid towers. But most of our towers are more solid because they've come in with the new building regs part L. And, um, but it's quite easy to make this sort of elevation look rather miserable. We started to look at it in slightly different ways, into barcodes and how it might manifest itself. We looked at other projects that we were working on and how planes could slide through. And um, in the end there you can see that um, this two-storey context on the high street, suddenly this 18-storey building became quite important for the project. And there is the, uh, one of the early versions of the Arboretum in the, in the foreground. One of the other narratives we had was colour. The Arboretum forms the colour for the building, so it starts off with the R whites colours, the yellow and the greens, and it turns around into browns and, 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 and olives. And to the top of the tower, what actually happens is it sort of fragments and almost breaks away. And this is slightly alludes to the, the um, Vicarage Fields, which is the, 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 the church in the middle of the town, which is sort of castellated. And in a way, this sort of gives um, a top to the town. The second city we're going to look at is Liverpool. Um, and we finished last year um, what was a, a very big project in Liverpool. It was the tallest tower in Liverpool at the time. Um, and it's, um, it's, it was located right on the waterfront, um, right next to the library buildings. Um, there is the library building on the right, which was, I think, the first building in England to have um, an elevator in, uh, very based on Chicago-style architecture, um, which was really when, you know, 100 years ago, when Liverpool had this very prosperous relationship with New York and America through shipping, very similar to Barking, in fact. Um, there again, you can see the River Mersey and the site itself. Most of Liverpool has been redeveloped in the last two years, half of it, mostly built around shopping. And a huge scheme just being completed this year. Um, the building is two towers. One tower is an office tower, one tower is a residential tower. The um, Northwest Development Agency gave £10 million to the developers to build the office building. 
There's not many places in the world that would happen because there were no contemporary office buildings in Liverpool. Um, and for them, they got um, 300 apartments to the left. It's just a split site because it's in two ownerships, so there's literally a party wall down the bottom. The ground floor has very little activity apart from sort of small retail unit. Um, and the idea of tying that ground floor together with this plinth is quite important to us. Uh, and as the building goes up, literally this party wall, you can see the blue, the office, the yellow, the, other, the residential. There are um, 90 different apartment types because of the shapes that we created within the town. Um, but predominantly it's based around this L-shaped section, so you can see there the orange and the yellow. And um, we have a, a corridor on every third floor of the building, and, and the apartments wrap around each other so that um, you get an up and over. So that there is the apartments, if you like, entering, going into the staircase, into your bedroom or up above to your living room. We started to look at how this might work elevationally and looked at the idea of weaving. We then started to do abstract versions of the elevation. In fact, this became a design for a rug. <laughs> and we looked at other influences that we always look at uh, with our work. And then we started to look at fragments of the building and the elevation and, and how the building might finish at the top of the building. And then the building at the end. So these abstract patterns with the cutaway balconies become quite important to us. Then what happened, Liverpool became European Capital of Culture, this is four years ago now, and it became important that this building would be a landmark for Liverpool. So we started to look at the top of the building, exploring how it might um, sort of um, be slightly more elaborate. Um, it was behind a building called the Atlantic Towers Hotel, which shaped like a boat, but it had no bridge. The Atlantic Towers Hotel, so we thought maybe something cantilever at the top might work, so we, we, if you like, we gave the building a bridge. We also looked at the idea of these motifs, this motif of a have a sort of pergola stretching over the building. Um, those black stripes reflect the double light flats. And again, then you can see how they start to sort of wrap over the building as it gets to the top. And then this bridge or box on top of the building um, became, if you like, the, 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 the two uh, penthouse apartments which overlook the whole of Liverpool. And, um, this box, which is loved and hated in Liverpool, you can see from everywhere you go in the city. Um, it's also happens to be the most expensive flats in Liverpool. For your money, you get um, what, what, you know, what you would imagine. Um, and then, um, what's interesting about when you're designing towers, you look at views. So everyone wanted the view to look onto the library building, but in fact, it looks over to Wales and to Wirral, which isn't much of a view. And the more interesting views were back to the city. Um, so the views aren't what they are when, you're, when you get high up there. We then looked at the idea of the two twins and how you look at two towers. How do you start to articulate the office tower? We looked at Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, but that was far too elegant. Ours were a tall, thin thing and a small, fat thing. So we felt this was a much more <laughs> appropriate analogy. And that there are our two slightly awkwardly shaped buildings sitting next to each other, um, and then in the city itself. I think um, finally we, um, yeah, this is just the office tower itself. And there you can see this very famous building in Liverpool on the left, which is Oriel, sorry, which is Oriel Chambers on the left. And, if you let our, our building slightly reflects oil changes with this checkerboard pattern going over the building. Finally, I think in towns it's important to have other layers and other layers of narrative. And we discovered Liverpool was where a lot of battleships ships were painted. They were Victorian, sort of World War I battleships, where vortices painted the battleships with different colours um, so that German U boats would find it difficult to know where the engine or the torpedoes were. And at first we used the palette of those colours around the building. And then we decided to use more direct quotations in the entrance lobby, so you get these very weird dazzle ship patterns as you go through. And finally, as you go up the building on every floor, when you come out, you get one of these patterns in a, a glass sort of glowing box as you come through the lift. And there is the building itself, which um, I think was within Liverpool was a set a new uh, benchmark for commercial buildings. Quite weird when this turned up. And you realise it puts your achievements in perspective because it, this was the QE2 in its final world tour, tour to, to Liverpool. Um, if you like, these are just some of our experiments, our own experiments in small towers. And um, it's been a great pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you very much.